So Rick Skinner is on the board of uh, Hens Analytics, and he's been kind of, so he knows these players really well, is the point I guess I'm making, Rick. <laughs> Too well. <laughs> so I've asked Rick to give us some introduction to who our speakers are. Well, good morning to uh, all of you, and I know you didn't get up this early and come this far just to listen to me, so I'm going to make this very short and succinct. But as Anton mentioned, I have had the pleasure of serving on the HIMSS Analytics Board since the organization was founded. And I can tell you that HIMSS Analytics is the most comprehensive source of information about the implementation of technology in healthcare around the world. They are also the creators of the MRAM model. Now, John, you will have to remind us what MRAM actually stands for, but it is uh, the most widely used and gold standard model for how far along an organization is in implementing electronic uh, systems in healthcare, first in hospitals and just introduced, as I'm sure John will talk to us about, in ambulatory settings. So it's a great pleasure to, one, welcome John to Toronto, and second, introduce John to the group. John is the Executive Vice President of HIMSS, responsible for and leading uh, HIMSS Analytics. John has a long history in the trenches with the rest of us as a uh, Chief Information Officer, a Chief Operating <coughs> Officer, working in consulting, and has led the HIMSS Analytics organization to the, I truly do believe, uh, world-leading uh, source of information about e-health. So without further ado, John. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> there is some static electricity up here, so when we make certain movements, you, that's what you hear. I threw, well, I threw water on the carpet, it didn't work. Um, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, the title, Intended and Unintended Consequences of EMRs. Uh, intended, I'm going to walk through some return on investment just quickly, and um, you'll see the, a construct for building a return on investment um, strategy around the, the tactics around what to collect before and during and after a, a complete implementation. That's what these are. We'll go through this in a second. Then following me, Lauren Pettit, our Vice President of Research for HIMSS Analytics, is going to walk through some unintended consequences, which is really kind of on the social research side and very interesting. So quickly, uh, what do we have here? The, the cost that the CFO would say, uh, if you're going to justify a big uh, investment in healthcare IT, we should track these hard costs. Okay, for sure, reduction of duplicate medical orders. We clearly can do that. We can see that. We've got plenty of evidence in the industry to support that. Reduction of paper-based costs, that's easy. You, know, you eliminate the cost of supporting, storing, maintaining paper. Uh, reduction of adverse drug events. An adverse drug event mathematically can be computed for costs. In, it's in the literature. Uh, an adverse drug event costs about $5,500 in our country, south of the border. Reduction of length of stay, uh, how is that a savings? It's a, it's a savings if you paid on a per case basis. Um, preventable readmissions, shift to outpatient home care and health plan savings. Well, it, that doesn't help unless you own a health plan. Well, some large integrated delivery systems in the United States actually own a health plan. <coughs> they sell insurance, essentially. Uh, so they're, they're trying to be like an HMO uh, in that respect, um, health readiness organization. Uh, soft costs and benefits, let's walk through quickly what this is, and this is what the CFO will argue about, and of course if the CFO is in the room, hello, we love you, <laughs> to a point. Um, the soft costs are uh, reduction of errors, hmm, well it, it's, a, it's a cost avoidance. Uh, reduction of potential losses, eventually this will accumulate in some benefit in liability insurance. Yes, that actually is demonstrable, it's in the literature. I know my organization, when we implemented uh, CPOE in the emergency department with the physicians with clinical decision support, those physicians had a 7% drop in their own liability insurance. So yes, uh, employee satisfaction. We have a, a, a case here we're going to show you, employee satisfaction, reduced turnover, turnover clearly in the, in the uh, clinical areas has a cost because we go through retraining of RNs and other clinicians. Uh, increase in medical staff satisfaction, Lauren's going to talk about that, ED cycle time, and increase in patient and family satisfaction. Now, you, 
That one is absolutely demonstrable. It's in the literature. It's been there since the mid uh, part of the uh, last decade. Around closed loop medication administration, when we are administering medications with barcoding the wristband and identify the patient, barcoding the drug, that improves confidence of the families, especially in pediatrics and in the emergency department. Um, Rick mentioned, and I will talk about this thing, we're going to show MRAM, EMR, adoption model. We're going to do some correlations between the scores of the EMR adoption model and some uh, other research which Lauren will talk to us about. Um, all right, so here's an organization that has, um, and they have 12 hospitals, this was conducted on seven of them. They implemented a enterprise-wide clinical system. This is in southeastern Virginia. The net cost of ownership for the system was $137 million. They actually it cost more than that, but th they had some offsets. And so they, that's why it's called net cost of ownership. They expected, this is their projection. This is their projection. They hired multiple consulting firms to design this. Um, the hospital is expected to save 30 million, various ways, we'll see that in a moment. On a uh, post-acute care, that is reduction of um, uh, home care, et cetera, they expect to save um, 2.7 million, the health plan expected to save 2.8 million, so they thought they would get the savings of about 35 million a year. That was their projection. Um, they're going to phase this in, because they didn't launch all the hospitals live at one time, as I mentioned, at 12. So they expected basically to have this in the 116 million in their benefits, and that's a 12.3% internal rate of return. Not a bad number. For those of you who follow the bond market, you're happy like two and a half percent. So that's what their projections were before they implemented this enterprise-wide system. Multiple consulting firms, pages behind this. We're just summarizing it quickly. So let's see what they actually did. They had this uh, for six hospitals in 2010, it's in the lower left over here. Um, they achieved 48.5. Remember, they thought they were going to earn 35.5 in benefits. They achieved 48.5, way ahead of the curve. Why did they do that? Here's where they, reduction of length of stay, reduction of adverse drug events. They projected $13 million in savings through the health plan or cost avoidance. Uh, increase in outpatient procedures, moving things to the outpatient basis, saving through the health plan. Increase uh, unit efficiency, retention of RNs. So there, were, there was a reduction in administrative staff and they significantly reduced their clinician turnover at a savings of several thousand dollars per slot. Where they used to you know, have a 12% or whatever the number was, now they have a 4%, they computed the savings on that. Reduction of transcription expense, that's obvious. Reduction of supply costs for medical records, that's obvious. Medical records positions eliminated, uh, 1.8 million in savings, health plan costs, etc. cetera. So you, you, you get the picture here. They achieved 48.5, so they were way ahead of their plan. Um, we have more detail on that. If you would like it, we can supply some more detail. But the whole point here is this, really. Let's go back and look at this page. This is what you construct. Your return on investment paradigm has got to meet something along this line. Those are the costs that you go after. That's what they did, and they proved um, with a 48.5 million in projected savings. We have we have a really strong interest in return on investment type data, quality improvement, efficiency improvement, satisfaction improvement, whatever. When a hospital earns the top stage of our EMR adoption model, which there are 97 now in the United States and two in Europe and one in Seoul, Korea, um, we ask them to write a case study. And this is some of the source, but not exclusively the source of some of these cases. Um, if you were to do a literature search, you see your recent articles on health information technology, a literature search, that came from Health Affairs and in the United States, and 92% of the articles in the last, uh, I think it was three years, um, are positive in terms of return on investment. Now, you could say that's an abnormal sample, because why publish if it's negative? Well, some people love to publish negative, and it gets a huge amount of press, which is why we try to counteract that with other studies. Um, hospitals with clinical decision support systems have shown lower costs for these types of heart failure, shock, myocardial infarction, cabbage, etc. Closed loop medication administration 
enterprise after enterprise after enterprise has shown when we implement barcoded medication administration and reduction of medical errors. And reduction, and, and again, again, what's an error? It's up to the organization to define an error. If you say delivering a medication 31 minutes after it was due is an error, then it's an error. There are also you know, other kinds of errors, you know, reactions, you know, drug, et cetera. Um, telehealth programs, Health Buddy is a, is a program that was actually run by our Veterans Administration for Chronic Disease Management and has shown um, significant savings in terms of about 11 or 12 percent a year for the people who have this little handheld device to communicate with the Veterans Administration daily. Um, it was built by Intel for uh, the Veterans Administration in a pilot project over two years. Uh, diabetes care, Cleveland Clinic has a study that was in health affairs about diabetes care on the uh, ambulatory basis following the protocols that are built into the electronic health record. Um, they had per better performance. Seoul National University is one of our stage seven that's actually pronounced. It looks like Bundang, it's Pundong. Seoul National University Pundong Hospital is our first state seven outside of the United States. And they have uh, massively uh, reduced their uh, transcription expenses. It was one of the more stunning examples. This is a 926 bed hospital with 4,000 outpatient visits a day. And at, at the end of our state seven validation, we physically go to the hospital, spend the whole day, three of us, okay, two CIOs and a CMIO. We walked into the medical records department or health medical records control as they call it, and asked to see the transcription, and it was like four people at a table like this. And we said, well, I thought maybe there's a misunderstanding of the you know, vocabulary, translation. Now, where's everybody else? No, that's all there is. 926 beds, 90% occupancy, 4,000 outpatients a day, four transcriptionists. So I thought, okay, just in case they don't understand what I'm asking, and they're using the dictaphones system for dictation transcription. I said, oh, print a backlog report. I want to see how old the reports are before they're typed. The oldest report was 42 minutes. Four people looking for something to do. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, that's a given. You probably know of Kaiser Permanente. 8.6 million members in nine states. They've got return on investment numbers all over the place. Here's this message here, this next one, 74 bed hospital. It does not have to be the great big large institutions, okay? 74 beds hospital is a stage seven hospital. And then the single family uh, is also an ambulatory world, single family a physician practice, about 4,000 annual visits. They've got uh, case studies on their protocol adherence, et cetera. So we just want to let you know, these are the kind of things we follow because it's extremely important to us. Now, so let's say we've, you're, you're along this line, how do hospitals correlate some of their EMR adoption model scores and other behaviors? So let's, that's what Lauren's going to talk to us on. I know I'm flying because I want to make sure Lauren has time to walk through these slides for you. Um, but let's pause. This is the EMR adoption model. And I, um, this stage one is you I have a pharmacy system, a lab system, a radiology system. State, uh, stage two is you've got a clinical data repository. So there's one place into which all orders, all results are, reside. So employees are not having to alt tab between systems. Stage three is nursing documentation. Stage four is uh, physician order entry with CPOE. Stage five is that closed loop medication administration where the patients are identified with the barcode on the wristband or RFID. A couple hospitals do that. That one in Seoul, Korea uses RFID. And by the way, as soon as an employee goes within a half a meter of the bed, an encounter is logged. Okay, so you know, how many times have you heard, oh, my mother's been here for three hours, hasn't seen a nurse. They know, bingo, the patient has been uh, seen by someone. Uh, stage six, physician documentation with structured templates creating discrete data so you can fire clinical decision support rules off of physician documentation. And the next thing is uh, complete EMR, and that's our stage seven. The point of this is that we've got five quarters here, and that's a little bit odd. You say, gee, why are you showing five quarters? Uh, about four weeks ago, four representatives in the United States House of Congress wrote a letter to the Health and Human Services uh, Secretary asking to suspend our stimulus program because they didn't think it was working. We don't agree with them. That's why we published this over five quarters. If you look at the upper stages, stages uh, five, six, and seven, over five quarters, they have all almost doubled. The stimulus program uh, does appear to be working in the United States. And by the way, there's a drop-off significantly in the zero one stages. 
Uh, the Canadian equivalent herein is here, okay? So this is what we're showing here over that same five quarters. I only do this just as the background for what now Lauren's going to talk about with some social research. Well, good morning, um, and it's good to be here. I uh, live in Franklin, Tennessee, but I'm from Winnipeg. Uh, which I guess also is known as Windsor in certain quarters, but um, it is good to be here. Um, I do research. Uh, I, my background has been in social research um, in healthcare organizations in the United States for a number of years. Um, I also teach at Indiana Uni University of Medical Sociology, and so I've taken a lot of this type of information, this, this sort of social component, and bring it to the lens of healthcare IT did some research and work with an organization in the um, United States called Press Ganey, which has sort of been synonymous with uh, patient satisfaction research. And when, during my time with uh, Press Ganey, I did a lot of uh, research and, and work with hospitals and their physicians, trying to really sort of get the, the two to work and play together well in the sandbox. Yeah. And so coming over to Kim's Analytics, there are some great insights that I had with the working with physicians, what is this EMR and, and sort of the angst that the EMR was bringing to the, the table with, with physicians and, and the hospital administration. So um, what I'm going to present is some research that with Press Ganey, we did um, physician satisfaction. The scale was like from a zero to 100, zero being low um, satisfaction, uh, 100 being high why this is important. Obviously in the United States with physicians and in the hospital, there's that competitiveness. As a hospital admi uh, administrator, you want to have your physicians to direct your patients to your hospital. Obviously, that's a different gig here in, in, in Canada. But the principle of having administration and physicians work well together in the sandbox is universal. And so I've worked with uh, hospitals in Canada with the same type of model, this same type of survey. And I've worked with the administrations there saying, are these questions still relevant? And the answer is yes. So there is an apl applicability with, with the information that we'll be going through here. So the first thing I just wanted to give you a, a sense of is a question that we ask around the ease of using the EMR. Now, obviously, I mean, this is hard to read at the back of the room, hard to read it actually at the front of the room. But let me just sort of point out one thing here. The ease of using the EMR is the one that's highlighted in gold, right at the bottom. We can look at the array of questions, everything from, um, you know, the, the quality, you know, the, the physician's evaluation and the quality of patient care here. Um, <coughs> how easy it is to use the, fa the facilities, uh, admitting your patients and the like. The questions that are at, at the low end on this scale, where at that sort of that same level of angst where the ease of using the EMR is, are questions that deal with the relationship between physicians and administration. <coughs> My point is, is that the, the type of angst that we have around the EMR is at the same level of angst and tension that there has been between physicians and administration. Now some of you may be balling up into the you know, fetal position when you see that, if you're like over the CIO and saying, okay, I've got this EMR. There is a silver lining here. Two things that we looked at when we sort of uh, divvied out the, the research here. One is really sort of, sort of, I will cast this, time is the healer. So when we look at by age, physician age, and how they evaluated the EMR, younger physicians, and I'm nearing 50, so when I see 35, less than 35, and that's young, um, eyeball into the fetal position, but you know, the, the, the point here is younger physicians have a much more positive view of the EMR. That's what's sort of on the horizon, but um, 35 and older physicians still look at the EMR and using of it and, and have a low view. So in time, we will see um, younger physicians, as they grow older, have a, a more positive view of the EMR. The other thing, this is a parking lot issue I want to come back to, is the second part, 
is that when we live at the years of, since nursing documentation has been implemented, with three years plus, we do see the, the physicians now having a much more positive view of the EMR. But if you are in that point of, of instituting or implementing nursing documentation, you've really ticked off your docs. And again, I want to come back to that because it's, it's a real significant issue. But over time, this familiarity, we will see physicians have a much more positive view. So what is, um, you know, the research around the intended consequences. One of the questions that we asked physicians was, you know, the access to patient information. You know, how, you know, how satisfied are you with the access to the patient information? And what we did was array it by um, these different stages. And by the way, I didn't really go into the methodology, I won't, but we had uh, over 25,000 physician respondents representing about 275 different hospitals in the United States. Looking at really sort of um, when you looked at the array of hospitals in the AMRAM and the hospitals that the physicians were um, evaluating, pretty close to one another. The only thing that we did not have were physician evaluations of hospitals at stage seven. So I think in, in time, as more hospitals get in there, but we will see more physicians that have evaluations and data points there. But the point here is that from stage zero to stage three, sort of flat lines in terms of the patient, or sorry, the physician's evaluation of access to patient information. But in stage four, we see it tip very positively and basically sustained throughout. So what happens at stage four? The CPOE is introduced. Physicians are brought to the dance. Suddenly, you know, the things that we do around to get physicians up the curve and, and understand the CPOE, it is elevating their view of the EMR and or pay access to patient inf information, which is um, tied to the EMR. All right, that's the intended consequence. Um, the glass half full view is when we look at physicians' relationship with administration. And I've controlled for hospital size, because we do know that hospital size doesn't matter um, in terms of physicians' relationship. When we control for hospital size, we still see this pattern is that you hit stage two, or you get to you hit to stage three, and your, your relationship, the physician's evaluation of their relationship with administration dives. It just tanks, and it's really sort of stays sustained throughout with some sort of variation, but there is a very statistical difference between the two. Why? What happens at stage three? Nursing documentation. Now, here is the social researcher trying to stand back and think, why might that be an issue? We have instituted nursing documentation before physicians. So physicians are wanting to uh, look at the record and they are being forced to go to the EMR. Being, they're being dictated to without being brought to the dance. The sort of the lesson for me in, in all this is that, you know, we have to bring in physicians early and often. Now, you've heard that before. But there's quantifiable data here that, that says that there is a real significant story that we do bring physicians in. One of the, I, I didn't bring a slide for this presentation, but we did look at, if you would sort of imagine, the y-axis is looking at physician satisfaction with administration, the x-axis looking at uh, ease of using the EMR, and we looked at physician satisfaction by this, the EMR vendor that they're using. Now, we have to be like Switzerland. We will not, we will never tell you, you know, one, uh, one vendor is better than the other. But the one data point that stood out, where that was the rock star vendor, was the self-developed EMR. Why? Because they are bringing in the physicians to the table, and they're bringing them in early and often. There's a sense of ownership. 
All right, so that's one part of the, the um, information that we looked at. Switching gears, another study that we looked at, um, again, using with uh, information from uh, Press Ganey, there was, um, we're, we're bringing in, instituting in the United States this thing called value-based purchasing. So uh, long story short, it, where we have paid hospitals off of the uh, volume of patients that we receive, we're sort of switching the model now to what's the value? What is sort of the outcome? So there's clinical performance as well as patient experience. Now, in the United States, uh, hospitals are mandated to collect core measures, which are the, your clinical scores. And then they're also mandated to collect patient satisfaction research, uh, the patient experience with HCAPs. The formula together here is what we call the value-based purchasing model. 70% of a hospital's score is going to be based off of their clinical performance. 30% off of the patient experience. What did we find when we look at it by the MRAM model? So this is, again, from 0 to 100, 0 being a low uh, clinical performance, 100 being you know, the rock star uh, clinical performance stages zero all the way through stages seven. We have uh, two tipping points. Just the mere fact of going from stage zero to stage one, where we're moving from being a paper environment to have some modem of electronic record, we increase our clinical performance. And again, I've controlled for hospital size on this. It doesn't matter. Just the mere moving into the, the, the clinical record, um, we have a positive view. Now, what's interesting, it sort of flatlines from stages one through stages five. Statistically, it doesn't matter. There's, there's not that much variation until we get to stage six. It statistically is, is higher. It's a tipping point. And then look at stage seven. Those are your rock stars. They've got it down in terms of the clinical performance. Clinical experience is rocking. Now, in my naivety, I had thought that this would be sort of a linear movement, that as you move from stage one to stage two to stage three, that you would see clinical performance eking up. It's not. It flatlines, and, and so it, the, the story there for me is that it is, uh, we just can't dabble with the EMR. It's sort of like an, an all or nothing type of proposition. Now, this is clinical performance. You know, and I know that there's a real uh, appetite for how is the EMR going to impact clinical outcomes. The other side of this story the unintended consequences. Let's take a look at the patient experience score. Now, it, it, does, it is not as telling. It's, there's a greater variability. But what re really highlights for me is stage seven. These, these are the hospitals that are your rock stars clinically. They've got you know, the full EMR capabilities. Um, they're good they have the lowest patient experience. And actually, if you sort of superimpose the two together, that's where you ball into the fetal position. It, there's this whole thing. When I used to be consulting in, in hospitals in the States, um, I always talked about administration about, you know, we have to be, you know, as you can position your hospital in the marketplace as being high tech or high touch. You, you gotta play in both. But, as a hospital, you can position yourself one way or the other. To the federal government, CMS in, in the United States, it doesn't matter, you gotta be both. What we're seeing here, arguably, is that hospitals, as they have moved up the EMR <coughs> stages, um, are, taking high, are, are going after the high tech at the expense of high touch. And you sort of think about why. What are sort of the, the things that we can do to educate um, clinicians in using the EMR? So 
I had a, a doctor's visit recently, a checkup, and the, the doctor had his, his iPad there with me, but he explained what he was doing. So every time that he was looking down, I, I was aware of what he was doing. He was maintain, he tried to maintain eye contact as much as he could, but you know, he had to manage you know, the, the iPad. And by just managing my expectations around that he's going to be using this technology in my care, I was good. Those are some of the skills I think that we have to impart to the clinicians as they're using the EMR so that we can be high tech, but high touch too. So it's just sort of pulling this together, as John had mentioned about you know, the hard costs. You know, we see the, the dollar values, there's an argument there. There's some definitely evidence that we're seeing some, our, um, so, some benefit. The soft costs are there too, but maybe a little bit more complex. Um, one of the things that I looked at when we go back to the physician satisfaction research is that it really you know, rubs to be in stage three. You have, in essence, sort of ticked off your docs and the physicians have not seen the benefits. They don't see that still until stage four. So you're in that sort of you know, rough land in stage three. Now, fortunately here or in the United States, what we have, what's propelling us, is meaningful use. The federal government is, is sort of incenting organizations to move forward with the EMR. I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think you have the same thing here in Canada. <coughs> I would implore you to not get stuck in stage three. The story in here is persistence, to keep moving forward, that there is an end to the end, uh, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but it is not something that we're going to necessarily see um, just by dabbling. We have to be in it for the long haul. The other thing I'll just sort of end on this, and, and John and I will open up for uh, questions. I, again, come from the social research standpoint. Um, I have not, I do not, have not been in the IT department. But I think part of the story here is that it's important for the IT department not to do this in isolation. We need to engage, um, I would say, organizational development, uh, that's, you know, or, or consult, those type of individuals that can actually you know, work throughout the organization and um, be aware of the, the workflow psychology, um, cultural issues, and address those so that when we are implementing the EMR, that it's just not an IT thing that it is an organizational thing, that it actually is for the patient. That's all I have to share. I do believe that you know, we will be presenting some of this information with, with Longwoods, or we have, you know, some of this research has been published on the HIMSS Analytics website, which is free uh, to access. But with that, how about I open up for uh, questions or comments and go from there? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. You presented uh, uh, great work with respect to clinical adoption, patient satisfaction. Have you done any work with respect to uh, impact on cost? The net effect of cost, we do have a slide of operating margin by MRAM stage. And it's a general upward trend, two through six, and then boom a big jump. Now, is it they had a bigger operating margin because they're stage seven or it's because they've always had a big operating margin, therefore they can afford to become a stage seven? We don't know, but we do know through 2000, in the data we had in 2011, um, there's a slight upward trend from two through six and then a, like a 80% jump in operating margin in 2011. Um, now, a reasonable question is, Let's go find those people in 10, 9, 8, and 7 and see how they did. And we're 
going to do that and publish that in spring. Yes, ma'am. Um, similar question, but on the health outcomes side. I know you've got clinical kind of quality of care, but any preliminary evidence or early evidence about yeah, yeah. health outcomes as a result of introducing automated systems? Um, um, outcomes in terms of chronic disease management vary just little bits here and there, but outcomes in terms of in, during the inpatient stay, reduction of errors, improvement of uh, protocol performance, um, adherence, absolutely rock solid. There's plenty of evidence on that. Chronic disease management is the long-term study, and there's just been little pieces of stuff. And that, that, that thing called Health Buddy from the Veterans Administration, that was a chronic disease management study. Kaiser is um, doing that right now with themselves over the years, and they've got some interesting statistics. Earlier this, this year, um, the German delegation was at the HIMSS uh, meeting in Las Vegas, and I was asked to present that type of information. What did it look like? And when we looked, at the um, EMR sort of shifting patterns um, from 06 to what we had at the most current time was 2011. It was actually fairly measured until 2009. And in 2009, it just shot right up. And then I would have expected, you know, the pattern to continue shifting, you know, fairly elevated from 2010 and 11. It went back to sort of a very muted shift. What happened in 2009 in the United States is that we had the stimulus that was instituted, um, ARA is the term we use, and the high-tech provision, which was to infuse dollars. There was an incentive. The, I guess the story for me, though, was that it wasn't sustainable. Why was it not sustainable? And that's a, it will be, would be interesting, again, to sort of compare the shifting patterns here um, between Canada and the United States. Do we see a shifting? And it, it, what will sort of create the incentives forward? Lydia, had a question? Uh, yeah. Comment and a question. So if, if you could share that operating margin information. Is that on your Analytics website? Uh, yes, it, it, well, I've got it here. I'll make sure you get it. Okay. And then the, the question is, did you ever consider that perhaps separating nursing documentation from physician documentation may not necessarily be the best strategy anymore? And that perhaps what we should be trying to do is do interdisciplinary documentation, whether it's in three, four, five, six, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know what's the right answer. I think orders probably do need to come before the physicians will mm -hmm. move to the chart. But have you guys talked about that and potentially considering, you know, changing up the MRM at all? We have not. Uh, okay, the question is, in, in restructuring the MRAM to bring nursing documentation and physician documentation together. The, the thing, maybe we're just lazy, but we've got seven and a half years of trend data. We'd have to redo it. Um, but it's not an invalid question. Yes, because we were together on a conference call 10 days ago and we walked through the ambulatory EMR adoption model and in that model we have physician order entry and physician documentation together at stage four in the ambulatory model. And you may say, gee, why did you do that? That was absolute positive feedback from the vendors. This is what we do. We build them together in that ambulatory world separating them to the vendors, because they're our advisors on this. We don't build this stuff in a vacuum. They advised us to put those two together, so. But it, this is somewhat historical at this point. We'd have to rebuild it. Yeah, but this might be kind of like so last decade, right? I know. You're right, I hear you. I know, I was, I was told by one vendor, you're looking old. <laughs> We have, well, we've got this ambulatory model, we've got this inpatient model. Mm. Any data about uh, the investment and change management over the project? What the value of investment has a positive effect on your, change, on your satisfaction results? And what investment uh, um, has the value added in the change management? We're not collecting data on how you did change management. That's a great 
uh, segue because that you know from you know I'm going to put my consulting hat on. That's what I would want to know as a consultant. What type of investments are needed, and how is that sort of impact to on the on the satisfaction? Uh, so no, but um, I think you've actually sort of stimulated a few thoughts here. The, you know the vendors want to know that because. I got same software in your hospital that's in your hospital, and you guys got massively different results. What's going on here? Change management is clearly one of them. All right, what? Are we gonna get thrown out, Anton? Uh, go ahead, All, All right. right. <clears throat> I'm just interested in this stage three, stage four question. Uh, I would have so maybe you can explain what would be going on. I would have thought that when you introduce the CPOE for the physicians you would have seen their satisfaction go back up if they were now on par with the other clinicians with their documentation, et cetera. Why was that trend flatlining thereafter? So, again, I, I teach sociology at Indiana University, uh, medical, uh, medical sociology, and so I'm going to put the sociologist hat on. Um, <clears throat> there's this concept called the deprofessionalization of medicine. Physicians have been professionals. They've had autonomy. Now they have been are, are much more of their job life, their work life is being regulated. It's being dictated to. And th this is my hypothesis is, is that when you have introduced something to a professional, it sticks. That you have been, it, it is a constant reminder that now you're just a cog in the machine and you don't have the autonomy, the professionalization that the profession that medicine once had. That's my, my, my hypothesis. Now, time will be the, I believe, will be the healer because as we see younger uh, physicians grow up into medicine and the expectation is, you know, we, we hear this um, anecdotally of residents coming out of um, you know, a the academic environment into um, a hospital, which is where they're just doing the residency, but they don't have all the bells and whistles. Um, that's frustrating. So there will be a demand for physicians uh, on administration to have those, those uh, I don't want to say toys, to have those, those tools. Patrick. Patrick. Oh, uh, over the weekend, I had a meeting with, uh, just happened meeting a physician from Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire, and we were talking about the Big Bang Epic implementation last year. On the clinical side, it's been spectacularly successful. And I said, what about physician satisfaction? And what he said was exactly what you just said. They're grumbling because they feel like they're cogs in the wheel. And then he conceded, they didn't tell us it would take maybe three years. And I said, how long did you think it would take for you to acclimate yourself to it? He said, oh, six months. So that's part of the problem. John, what about, how about, we've got a minute, how about a quick advertisement for the ambulatory MRAM, which you alluded to, but we didn't have a slide on. Um, we have built an ambulatory EMR adoption model. Uh, we began collecting data in the United States on it in October of last year. So we now have a year's worth of data. We have some <clears throat> organizations in stage six, uh, nothing yet in stage seven. Uh, we march through the model in terms of, you know, at stage uh, zero, it's absolutely no clinical, you can, you can have a practice management system with no clinical documentation or of any sort, clinical use of any sort, no clinical data repository where all information for the patient is in a patient, beginning of a patient-centric record. So there's none of that at stages zero and one. One, we begin a little bit. Stage two, clinical data repository, I'm now starting to pour maybe some PDF files and some documentation that from the outside in. Stage three, nurses are documenting in the practice, uh, at not necessarily 100% at in the encounter room, uh, but stage four is 100% nursing documentation in the encounter room and physician order entry and physician documentation because they're built together in that ambulatory world. Stage five is that we're looking to, at that point to have a patient portal um, and a personal health record maintained by the ambulatory environment for the patients to use. Stage six is full-blown clinical decision support, protocol adherence, um, uh, drug recall, device recall capability in stage seven, it, like we would do in the, like we do in the, in the inpatient world, uh, would be a site visit and to prove processes, et cetera. 
You have a question? Yes, ma'am. Quick one. I'm, just, I'm curious whether or not HIMSS has anything similar to the adoption model, but at the level of the, the academic institutions teaching our new graduates. So are you following any of the universities as far as the faculty of medicine, pharmacy, nursing, allied health um, departments as far as their use of EMRs as teaching tools? Not no. The answer is no, but with seven years of data, it's been pretty consistent that the academic medical centers have had, for years, the higher scores. So they're, obviously they're de deploying these sooner. Now what, one anomaly to which Lydia was getting at with the question about documentation and CPOE, a lot of organizations, academics, have implemented CPOE long time ago before nursing documentation. Why did they do that? They're teaching residents how to order, okay? So they've had that history. Academic medical centers have had higher scores for a long time. But you know what? Now there's getting to be an age problem, not of the people, but of the systems that they're using. And some of the community hospitals are passing them by. But, this is what I'm <clears throat> but I'm not getting into the departments as. No, but thank you for that. But I guess maybe I didn't rephrase but looking at it as the teaching institution, so teaching our future <coughs> generations of clinicians, nurses, pharmacists at the level of the university. So trying to look at whether there's stimulus money going in or, or mm. investment money going into the universities to teach our new graduates so that when they do come out as those 35 and unders, they're also the ones that are prompting the, the hospitals where they're doing their residencies and teaching to bring it up. <coughs> We're not, <clears throat> we're not getting to that, but it does remind me, um, I'm going to divert, digress seemingly. Six, seven, six years ago in the United States, we hit an inflection point that was sort of unnoticed. 51% of the medical school students were female. Bingo. What does that mean to a CIO? It's a different world. Uh, then these folks need to leave the office at 515 to be on the soccer field and have their charts done. And if you can't support that, you're losing your staff. You better get the message. So uh, John and Lauren, I promised people that they'd have a few minutes just to go down the, down yep. the hall to some other presentations. Get a good seat. And by, by way of thanking you, I just want to introduce you to the uh, chair of uh, Richard Alvarez's shop. So Graham Scott is sitting way over there, and maybe he'll come up later and just say hello so that you guys have met. So. Okay. So thank you very much for, you for coming all the way down here and taking this question. <coughs> thank you.